Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to the organizers for letting me talk at the conference. Um, the talk I'm going to give today is entitled Singapore Immunology Network's Clinical Immunomonitoring Platform as Applied to the Assessment of Immune Responses in Cohort Studies and Clinical Trials. So first, just to, to show you, as indicated by the name, we're based in Singapore. As shown over here, you see the skyline of Singapore and the iconic Marina Bay Sands, sorry, Marina Bay Sands Hotel. And up in the top here, you can see the building where we're housed. This is called Immunos. It's part of the Biopolis Complex, which is under ASTAR, the Agency for Science, Technology and Research within Singapore, which is a Singapore government-funded institution. And SIGN was essentially started six years ago in January 2008 to be a leading international research center in human immunology. So just to give you a little bit of background to the institute, as you can see, we have an extremely diverse background, about 22 principal investigators from 12 different countries. We have eight senior PIs, nine junior PIs, and four PI technologists who each are responsible for core technology. We also have an industry development group that I'm a part of. And as you can see, in the last six and a half years, we've actually, the output has been 515 publications with about 94 with an impact factor of greater than 10. So the areas covered by the institution include inflammation, immunoregulation, and infection. Probably the area that is going to be most relevant to the, to the participants at the conference will be the infectious area. We have individuals working in host fungi interactions and microbiota, malaria, dengue. We actually, one of the PRs has developed a dengue vaccine, an attenuated dengue vaccine, which has been shown to have protective efficacy in mice in the tetravalent form and also against DENV2 in non-human primates. We also have work going on in chikungunya, lipid immunity in TB, and also in influenza. So essentially, if I look at the summary of the platform, the immunomonitoring platform is dedicated to defining immunomarkers or biomarkers and immunological endpoints with clinically relevant impact via high throughput acquisition of immunological data from cohort studies, clinical trials, and also relevant preclinical models. We do this by leveraging on our suite of capabilities, which include flow cytometry, functional genomics, bioinformatics, and also CITOF. And also importantly, we're supported by the scientific expertise of science PRs and their particular domain expertises. We build capabilities and licensing opportunities through partnering with key players. This includes the broader clinical community in Singapore and abroad, also industry, and we aim to co-develop novel diagnostics and clinical interventions. So the structure of the platform is as follows. We have, as mentioned, the immunophenotyping, which is flow cytometry. It also includes a, a very advanced Luminex platform. We have a functional genomic setup, deep immunophenotyping by CITOF, and a comprehensive bioinformatics team, and this is all supported by a project management team. So if we look at the workflow of the platform, you can see we have a fully integrated system, and we really like, if possible, to, to be involved in the whole downstream and upstream analysis of the study. So if we look at an example here, you can see samples may come from a cohort study or clinical trial. They'll be collected as per SOPs, depending on the nature of the study. This may be bloods, urines, stools, uh, PBMC isolations, they are then biobanked. At a later point, the, the samples are batch thawed. They may be analyzed by different technologies, which I'm going go to short, go into shortly. That then gets integrated and analyzed by our bioinformatics team, and at the end we have data interpretation. So the platform is actually an intellectual partner. We don't actually do fee-for-service on the platform, rather we, we prefer to do research collaboration agreements. So the platform is actually involved in from early discovery to relevant preclinical studies to clinical trial assessment. And it can be applied in different areas, like discovery of biomarkers, target identification, vaccine assessment, or even drug-induced immune profiling. To give you a little background into our technologies, flow cytometry facility is led by Anis Labi. He actually has an independent research group in aging and immunosenescence as well. Not to go into everything, but we're a fully certified ICC certified flow facility. Out of 146 personnel who have been certified worldwide, we actually have four of those. We have a lot of high throughput systems. We actually have 10 
machines in total, three of which are for sorting and the rest for, for doing high throughput analysis. Also, we're involved in development of new assays and, of course, we use standardization. So, to give you an example, one of our PIs, Florent Genois, is a world expert on myeloid cell and, de and dendritic cell biology. He's developed a number of novel panels that have been published and we actually, if they're appropriate, we actually incorporate them in the analysis of our platform. So then to look at the, at the site off, if the collaborator is interested in doing deep immunophenotyping, then they may choose to do site of analysis. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with site of technology, so I'll just very briefly go into the principle. So site off utilizes essentially two principles, flow cytometry and mass spectrometry. Flow cytometry is, is a very powerful technique, but it's, the limitation is the fluorescent spectral overlaps, which actually then limit the number of combinations that one can achieve. With a cytof, instead of using antibodies conjugated with fluorochromes, you use elemental isotopes, which are then tagged to the antibodies. Cells are then stained in the normal manner. They fire through in, single, in, in a single form. They go through an argon plasma beam at 800 degrees Celsius. This obliterates the cells, but it actually ionizes the elemental tags. And this is then read in the mass spectrometer, and the readout is actually time of flight, hence it's called site of or time of flight. As you can see, if you look in the bottom here, your readout then are mass spec peaks, which are very narrow. You can actually resolve up to 100 narrow peaks. And Evan Newell, who's actually a world leader in site of technology, has been able to do greater than 40 independent parameters per cell, which actually allows more than one trillion possible metal combinations. So he's regularly publishing it at a high level. Here's one paper which he published about two years ago, which was in Nature Biotech. This showed his combinatorial tetramer staining, looking at antiviral CD8 responses. And this was then also reviewed in, uh, in Nature, cracking the code of human T-cell immunity. Up to this point, Evan has actually been able to do 500 epitope plex analysis. So you can actually do pretty much full epitope mapping of, of uh, viruses and some organisms. So what he does is he actually takes the relevant HLA, can um, incubate that with uh, up to 500 different epitopes. This can then be used to stain a single sample, including up to 30 antibodies, which may include surface or intracellular antibodies. So you get very deep phenotypic data in addition to epi looking at epitope-specific responses. Then we have a functional genomics group led by Francesca Tulezzi. They have capabilities to do classic genomics, metagenomics, transcriptomics, and epigenomics. They also have a fluid diamond nanostring, so they, they utilize this in looking at single cell uh, transcriptomics as well. And this is all supported by our comprehensive bioinformatics team, which is led by Mike Poidinger. Mike has had a lot of industry experience with J&J &J and Eli Lilly. He has a team of eight uh, postdocs who are actually coders and also bioinformaticians, and they're actually involved in getting the most out of the data sets that are generated. Just to, not to go into a lot of detail here, but they develop uh, relevant workflows for uh, the particular analysis and a particular study. They use a lot of visual, visualization techniques like Spotfire. And also I'd like to point out that they also have Transmart, which is a translational data warehousing system, which allows you to incorporate in heterogeneous clinical data sets. You can also put in associated biological or immunological data sets from Cytov, Luminex, flow cytometry. And this data set can then actually be queried by clinicians, scientists, or collaborators. So it's a very powerful tool to utilize. So to give you some examples of studies that are being conducted on the platform, we're actually doing a number of different studies, but I'm just going to give you a taste of three different studies. So shown over here, this is an immunoprofiling of a cohort done by Anis Labi's group in aging and immunosenescence. So Anis has developed with a collaborator in Singapore an enormously powerful resource, which numbers about 6,000 elderly individuals. You can see here in three different cohorts. The study is called SLAS, or Singapore Longitudinal Aging Study. If you look over here, you can see that these are individuals from the age of 55 up to about 90. These 6,000 individuals are actually Singaporean Chinese, and they have an enormous amount of data on these individuals that have been surveillanced. You can see some of them up to 11, for 11 years now. They have nutritional status data. They have um, behavioral data and um, many other factors, which is a, a very powerful resource to plumb the depths of. You can see over here they have clinical specimens, clinical data, and all the participants are recallable. 
In terms of biobanking details, they have plasma, serums, PBMCs, and DNA for immunological and genomic studies. And this is quite a unique setup. So just to show you one classic example, Anis is going to look deeper than this, but to show you something you'll be familiar with, when looking at a young cohort that was uh, recruited in Singapore versus the old cohort, if you look at frequencies, but the same is also shown for absolute numbers, you can see as expected that the elderly individuals have lower numbers, frequencies, and absolute numbers of CD8s. And inversely, they actually have more CD4s than do the young individuals. Now, if, if we focus on the elderly individuals and we look at markers associated with immunosenescence over here, shedding of CD27, CD28, or upregulation of CD57, you can actually see that the CD8s compared to the CD4s actually show more sensitivity or susceptibility to immunosenescence. Then using classical markers shown over here, 45RA and CD27, and looking at different phenotypic subsets, you can see that as expected, looking at the double positive naive population, the elderly individuals, of course, have uh, much fewer naive CD8 T cells. But if you look at the last one over here, the 27 negative 45 RA positive, you actually see that the senescent T cells, or the so-called temeras, are increased in the elderly individuals. And these are so-called senescent T cells. Um, as we know, they're poor responders. They're pretty dysfunctional, and they're replicatively senescent. But an interesting question to pose, and Anis is looking at, uh, could these be a possible target for boosting immunity? Um, we all know that, as an example, exhausted T cells, um, in the past they were dysfunctional and, and we weren't able to, to, uh, to boost them or to get functionality, but now by blocking various co-inhibitory pathways, like PD-1 and CTLA-4, we're actually able to reverse this dysfunctionality. Um, so we have studies ongoing where we're looking at senescent cells, versus exhausted cells to see whether we can actually discriminate specific senescent markers and if these may be a, a strategy to actually reverse the dysfunctionality. So to look at another cohort study, this, these are the young individuals that I, I showed you in the, in the earlier study. Um, Olaf Rochko is a PI in the institute, has recruited up to about 900 young uh, students in Singapore. These are also Singaporean Chinese. And um, he's made this resource available to the institute and also to collaborators. And they're taking a systems biology approach looking at, at different scientific areas of interest. This is just to show you one example. The first area they looked at was looking at atopy and allergy. Um, as you can see over here, they actually looked at both um, allergen specific, but also not shown here, total IgE, as well as skin prick tests. And they looked at the classic allergens which are, are known to be directed against in Europe and, and United States. And these include house dust mite, fungi, pollens, pet dander, and cockroaches. And as you can see, surprisingly and very strikingly, the Singaporean individuals, the, the young healthy group, about 70% of them actually mounted a response. This is a house dust mite specific response against both DERP1 and also Blumia tropicalis, which is a, which is a uh, house dust mite which is found in the tropical area, and hardly any response against any of the other classical allergens, which was a very surprising and interesting result. So they decided to look at this further, and this also correlated with total IgEs as well as also skin prick tests uh, against different allergens. So if we, if we break this down and we actually look at the responders according to categories, category zero being non-responders, category one being the least, and six being the highest. They then looked at a sub-cohort of this, and you can see if you look at the house dust mite IgE positive individuals, it makes up about 70% of this particular sub-cohort. If you look at the house dust mite IgE negative individuals, you see approximately 30%. When they further broke this down, looking at the positives, you can see that approximately three quarters have a response exclusively against house dust mite allergens, whereas just over a quarter actually respond to different allergens. Whereas if you look at the house dust mite IgE negative population, amazingly they found that 95% of them only, 95% 90, of them are, are completely unresponsive also to all the other allergens, and only 5% responded to other allergens. So they defined this as a truly non-atopic population because they actually don't respond to house dust mite or any of the other classical allergens, and they're actually doing it's a more systems biology approach to, to take a look at these complete non-responders and try and understand mechanistically why are they not responding and could this be 
interesting pathways to actually intervene in the future. Just to also mention, when looking at clinical consequences, because you may say, you know, they have these huge responses against house dust mite, they found that individuals um, had allergic rhinitis and asthma, but not allergic dermatitis. So they, they saw an association or a link between uh, house dust mite specific IgE and airway hyper responsiveness, but not skin allergies. So Singapore is, in this context, is a perfect environment for studying allergies, particularly if you're interested in, in house dust mite, because you have almost an exclusive response against house dust mite allergens, and it will be a very interesting cohort to look at in terms of mechanistics and also seeing whether you can actually clinically intervene against this particular allergy. So just to show you a final example uh, conducted on the platform, this was a study done by Evan Newell from the CITOF group in collaboration with Alessandro Sete from uh, La Jolla San Diego. Shown over here, this is actually a paper published uh, by Sete's group, which was appeared in, in PNAS. What they did is they looked at um, a few hundred Sri Lankan individuals who were exposed to dengue, and they did epitope mapping shown over here, and, um, and they, they actually found, uh, using, using a particular predictive algorithm, uh, they looked at um, almost 400 epitopes, and then using pools of those actually looked at uh, specific responses, interferon gamma, Eli spot assays. What I'd like to contrast here is using the classical Eli spot assay, you need to do hundreds of assays per donor. You get no associated phenotypic data, and of course it's peptide pool resolution because they were pooling approximately four peptides, I think, per pool, and that was still over 100 different assays. Evan used the CITOF assay, he could do a single assay per donor because he, he put all 400 epitope HLOs in a single sample. You get deeper, deep phenotypic data associated with this, and you can actually get single peptide resolution. So just to break this down, he looked at 354 predicted dengue epitopes, 43 control epitopes in the same sample, and these included things like EBV, HIV, CMV, flu, rotavirus. So he had control, internal control epitopes. This is 397 tetramers, and this was on the HLA 1101 background because this is actually one of the most prevalent haplotypes in the Chinese population. So I don't have time to go into a lot of detail here, but if we look at two individuals in terms of phenotypic responses, so Evan over here looked at using principal component analysis, you can resolve different populations, and you can see over here you can define uh, different T cell phenotypes according to these populations. If you look on the left hand side, you're looking at asymptomatic. Dengue exposed on the right-hand side, sy symptomatic four-month post-infection. And I think the take-home message, if you look over here, these are the total CD8s, and if you look below, these are the tetramer epitope-specific, dengue-specific CD8s. You can actually see a difference in terms of the phenotype. It looks like you have primarily a central memory response in this asymptomatic individual, whereas this other individual who was, was looked at four months post-symptomatic infection had more an effector response. So... So in summary, Evan was, in, in this particular study, able to uh, do full epitope mapping. He discovered 14 new epitopes that hadn't been seen before, mapped them and validated them subsequently. He saw different epitope usage in asymptomatic versus clinical cases, what I, I showed you earlier. And also, I, I don't have time to go into it, but he also looked at longitudinal changes in the same individuals um, during or, or post uh, dengue infection, and he also saw phenotypic changes. So I'll just briefly, I'm not going to go into other studies, but I think of relevance to the, the uh, conference here, is we have an ongoing study, which is still in a very early stage, which is done with Sanofi Pasteur. This is a phase four clinical trial, and it's looking at immune responsiveness in flu-vaccinated elderly. So up to now, we've already enrolled and vaccinated 240 individuals, 210 elderly between 65 and 90, and 30 young individuals. They've been vaccinated with Vaxigrip, and then bloods and salivas were taken at day 0, 2, 7, and 28, so classical uh, vaccine kinetic time points. And then at a later stage, after hopefully signatures have been defined, looking both at clinical data sets, but also pretty much looking at uh, incredibly comprehensive biological, immunological readouts, hopefully after another shot at 18 months, we'll be able to validate 
the signatures. So finally, I'd just like to acknowledge all the individuals who were involved in this. First of all, the immunomonitoring platform, all the PRs and co-PRs on the platform, all the signed contributors who were involved in the studies, and finally, the clinical collaborators from different hospitals in Singapore who provided the samples. Thank you. are available for labeling? So, to my knowledge, I, I know that the theoretical uh, possibility goes up to about 100 different, around about 100 combinations. I don't think they've achieved that yet. Um, there's one company called DVS, which uh, is involved in, the, in the, both building the machines and providing reagents. Evan, the power of, it, of Evan is not only does he do the site of work, but he also um, is involved in the, in the tech development as well. Um, both with DVS and also with other companies. He develops his own tetramers. Um, he's also involved in developing his own tags uh, with DVS. So I, I would say that probably around about 40 to 50 tags at the moment. Um, 